Hey boy girls. So a lot of you have heard about the Asian skincare routine by now, but for those of you who haven't, I'd like to give a quick basic lecture. It's probably actually not gonna be that quick um, because there's a lot of steps involved, but we'll get to that. So my main objective is to take the Asian skincare routine and apply the poor girl filter over it so it's more accessible to those with limited funds. To get to the point where you're buying products, you first should have an understanding of how the routine works. So to start with, Asian skincare is way more broad than what we here in the West are used to. Um, for us, it's mostly just like cleanse, moisturize, maybe some kind of serum if you're really feeling crazy. Um, it's more about just what's easy and it's like a very basic skin maintenance type routine in the West most of the time unless you put extra effort into it. A basic Asian skincare routine is way more involved but it also has more potential for payoff. It starts with cleansing as you may have guessed. But wait, put that cleanser down. If it's nighttime, first you cleanse, then you cleanse again. Yes, you heard right. The Asian skincare routine has two cleansing steps. Two. The first is generally an emulsifying oil cleanser. Basically, you spread an oil cleanser all over your face to loosen up any makeup, oil, or product that you have on. Then you wet your hands and you mix the water in to loosen up all that stuff so it washes off easily. There's a few alternatives to cleansing oil. There's balms, sorbets, oil gels, but most girls start out with regular cleansing oil and experiment from there. Uh, I recommend you do the same, see what works for you. Now, the magic of this first step is that when you use your usual cleanser, it's doing a way more effective job at cleaning your face because it doesn't have to slough through like 10 layers of product to get there. Um, it's just cleaning a pretty blank slate now. In the morning, you can generally ignore this step um, unless you slept in your makeup or something, which you should never do. The first thing we should do when looking at potential cleansers is examine the pH of the cleanser. We have an outer barrier of moisture on our skin, which ranges from about 4 to 6 on the pH scale. The acidic layers of this barrier, or the acid mantle, helps to stop growth of bad bacteria, fungi, parasites, and a host of other bad crap. Basically, it's like your own personal superman on your face. Now when you use a cleanser with a higher pH than your skin, you're disrupting your acid mantle. It's like you're taking kryptonite and rubbing it all over your facial supermen and telling them to suck it because you like Marvel Comics better. There's nothing wrong with liking Marvel better, but now your skin is open for all that bad bacteria which we will now refer to as Lex Luthor to attack your face. The fallout of Lex Luthor's attack on your face can range from infection, acne, irritation, dryness, and other unwanted problems. So, to prevent Superman's downfall, try to stick to cleansers with a pH of 6 or lower. If you just can't find the pH of your cleanser online, they do sell pH testing strips at like aquarium shops and home brewing stores for like beer and stuff. Um, they have pH strips that you can use to test your cleanser. Just make sure that you get one that tests a full range that, um, of pH, which is 1 to 14. Um, they're usually meant for testing water, not urine or mm, saliva, I think is the other kind that do it. I actually accidentally bought some at Petco that only went from like 6 to 14, and I didn't know if my cleanser was below 6, so important to know. I want to stress that I'm not telling you to throw your cleanser away and buy a new one. I know on a budget that's not a easy thing to do when cleansers can run about like $10 each. Um, but I do want you to think of it come empty bottle time what a good cleanser might be for you to try out or if your current cleanser is right in the range of where you want it to be. So after you're washing your face you're going to be using a toner. Um, and toners are used for any of the following reasons. To remove any last residue that might be left on your face, to moisturize, 
to prepare your skin for pH dependent actives, which I will get into in a bit, or to work actives into your routine. Actives is basically just a short way of saying active ingredients, which are responsible for the proposed benefits a product may have. So a few examples of popular actives in Asian skincare include vitamin C, niacinamide, arbutin, and snail goo. And yes, it is snail secretion. Of course, there are many, many more actives. It's all a matter of customizing what your skin needs into your routine. Which of these things your toner is doing, whether it be moisturizing, lowering your skin's pH, or working actives into your skin, it all depends on the type of toner you're using. So generally, there are pH adjusting toners and there are hydrating toners, although sometimes they can be one and the same. It all just kind of depends, but we want to keep them separate for the purpose of this explanation. So while my ramble of pH is still fresh in your mind, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start by explaining the pH adjusting toner. So typically, if you're using a high pH cleanser on your face, you're going to have to wait about 20 to 30 minutes before using any pH dependent actives on your skin. Now I know we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves because I haven't discussed pH dependent actives, but bear with me. But anyway, if that's something that you are going to use to skip that inconvenient wait, one would use a pH adjusting toner. pH adjusting toners are acidic, which is what brings down your pH quickly. If you use a low pH cleanser already, using a pH adjusting toner isn't really necessary because your skin is already going to be in the range of where you want it to be, um, but some pH adjusting toners just have other benefits that you might still want to use it for. It's just, you know, maybe budget wise, if you're looking to cut costs, uh, that would be where you would cut it because it wouldn't be necessary. A moisturizing toner is just that, it's moisturizing. It usually has ingredients in it to help hydrate your skin. It's really just kind of getting that extra little help into your routine. So now your skin should be ready for the next step, which is optional, but also highly effective. And that is using your actives. And I'm gonna start with the pH dependent actives because those are the ones you're going to use first if you're going to use them. As I said before, actives are what are directly responsible for delivering proposed benefits to your skin. Three of the most popular pH dependent actives used in Asian skincare include vitamin C, AHAs, and BHAs. It's important not to abuse pH dependent acids. You can damage or irritate your skin by overdoing it. If you are using more than one in one go, the order of your actives should be lowest pH dependent product to highest. To be effective, your L-ascorbic acid vitamin C product should be about 2 pH. This means it's usually the first pH dependent active you would use. If your vitamin C solution is a vitamin C blend or another form of vitamin C, it will have a higher pH and therefore will not be as complicated to use. AHAs are chemical exfoliators which should have a pH of 4 or lower to be in the proper exfoliating range. As shown in the chart I just had up a minute ago, common AHAs are glycolic acid, lactic acid, malic acid, citric acid, and tartaric acid. Look for the AHA ingredient to be second or third on the ingredient list of a product because you want the product percentage to be over 5%. BHAs are also exfoliants which are also ineffective over 4 pH. You want your product to have over 1% BHA which means you can look for the ingredient which is salicylic acid to be in the middle or the end of the ingredient list. If you use a pH dependent product, it is recommended to wait 20 to 30 minutes until applying your next product. However, there are many popular serums, essences, and ampoules that are not as fussy as the ones with pH dependent ingredients. Always research the ingredients in a product before you buy it to be better informed on where it stands in your routine. So now that you have or possibly haven't used a pH dependent product on your skin, your skin should now be ready for treatments. These specialized treatments are usually come in the form of serums, essences, and ampoules. The difference between serums, essences, and ampoules are basically like the consistency. Um, essences tend to be waterier and serums and ampoules are a little more on the thicker side. 
They all generally hydrate somewhat, but they're more about the active ingredients and what they can do for your skin. For example, someone with dry skin might want products containing hyaluronic acid, glycerin, or perhaps niacinamide, which all have hydrating benefits. Someone with oily skin may want to try products with yeast ferment extract. Often, this comes in the form of galactomyces or saccharomyces. If you have acne issues, products with snail secretion, salicylic acid, or glycolic acid may help. If you have scarring, try vitamin C, snail goo, arbutin, yeast ferment extract, or kojic acid. If you're dealing with redness, snail secretion, green tea extract, or aloe vera are among ingredients that may help. If you have multiple issues, you can use multiple products to target them. The rule of thumb for layering these products is apply the thinner, waterier products first and work your way up to the thickest, creamiest consistency. Now, a few lucky people might find that their skin is adequately hydrated after their treatments, but for most people, we're gonna need a moisturizer to lock in all those goodies that you just put on your face. Now, this is where emulsions and creams come in. Um, emulsions are really light moisturizers that do better with oily skin or if you live in a hot, humid environment. And creams are thicker and they do better with dry skin or in a dry, cold climate. Uh, some people spot moisturize and they only really put moisturizer where they need it. Um, some people will use the two different types of moisturizers in different areas depending on where they feel needs like an emulsion and where they feel they need a cream. Some people will just use both all over and some forego this step altogether. It really just depends on your skin and what it wants. Lastly, and this is always last, is sunscreen. Um, this is so, so, so important. You should be wearing sunscreen every day. I'm not saying that to nag you but it is really, really essential that you wear sunscreen. Some ingredients that you might be using in your routine, such as AHAs and retinoids, like Retin-A, Tretinoin, um, can be, those ingredients will make your skin more sensitive to the sun, so you like super wanna protect your skin if you're using those ingredients. Uh, but even if you're not using ingredients that make it more sensitive, you sh should not skip it anyway because you just, it's like prevention is better than the cure so you know sunscreen it up if you do sunscreen religiously every day your skin will thank you 10 years down the road understand these products don't always have to be used in one routine and most routines differ depending on whether it's daytime or nighttime you won't need an oil cleanse first thing in the morning and you won't need sunscreen before bed Common sense goes a long way in fleshing out a routine, but so does online help, so don't hesitate to research when you have a question. There are no dumb questions when you're first learning about all this craziness. So now you guys should be ready for my Poor Girl's Guide to Asian Skincare Products. Uh, that's going to be the part two of this video, so yeah.